everybody. This is Jesse Weber. We are joined today by law and crime senior editor, former prosecutor Ron Blitzer. Ron, we were just watching uh, the testimony yesterday in the Adam Matos penalty phase of this case, and we saw the testimony of Dr. Noel Palma. And how important is it, or what did you make of the fact that that distinction between, okay, uh, when did the victims lose consciousness? When did the victims, uh, do we know when they were killed? What, did they experience pain or suffering? Was it possible that they were able to move on their own or were they dragged? You know, the, these little distinctions I'm sure are very important, um, but what did you make of it uh, viewing that? For me personally, uh, I don't put that much stock in this kind of testimony. Uh, we've heard the evidence from the trial. We know what happened. Uh, to get into the details of exactly what the natures of the injuries that we already heard about were, how much these people may have suffered. It's all horrible stuff. Uh, this guy has been convicted of four counts of first degree murder. That part's taken care of. We know that this was bad. If you wanna go into exactly how bad the injuries were in order to prove a case uh, that this was so bad that he should die, uh, maybe that will work for some jurors. It wouldn't work for me personally. Uh, you have to go into the nature of the actions for me and the mindset of the defendant more so than uh, the actual injuries that we know resulted in death anyway. Uh, so if you want to talk about what made this so bad, talk about Matos as a person, talk about uh, the act itself, uh, to get into uh, the nitty gritty and the grisly uh, injuries here, uh, that doesn't work for me. Maybe it'll work for other jurors. Yeah, we're talking today because right now at around 9.30, 9.45, we expect our live coverage back in the Adam Mastos case out of uh, Pasco County, Florida. The, we expect closing arguments from the state, closing arguments for the defense in this death penalty phase, and we'll have to determine, well, it's not for us to determine, it's for the jury to determine whether or not this man should be sentenced to death. Uh, Ron, do you think you expect a quick decision on part of the jury? I mean, they did render a verdict. Uh, in this case, in two and a half hours, I will say right now, I'll, I'll tell you right now, I don't think it's going to be as quick and easy as that because I think the determination to sentence someone to death is a little bit different than convicting them in connection with the crime. Absolutely. Uh, it may be quick, it may not be, but the fact that the deliberations were so short in the main phase of this trial has nothing to do with this. As you said, it's a completely different issue. You can look at the evidence and say, yes, he killed these four people. He's guilty of first degree murder. Uh, we don't buy the self-defense argument, but this is different. Now you have to determine, does this person deserve to die? Am I ready to be the one to sentence him to death? And that is something a lot tougher. People could you know, be against uh, the death penalty. People could have uh, thought that they had an open mind when they went in, when they were selected as jurors, they could have thought, yes, I'm in favor of the death penalty, I have no problem. And then when they're faced with that decision, they could start hesitating. Or they could have in their mind, yes, you know, in some cases people deserve to die, but is this one of those cases? Maybe, maybe not. You know, we were talking off camera about how you know, the death penalty is supposed to be for the worst of the worst. Where do you determine what that line is? Yes, this was a horrible crime. Does he deserve to die? Maybe. Does the jury feel that they deserve to be the ones to sentence him to death? Maybe, maybe not. Uh, this was uh, a horrible, gruesome quadruple murder. Does that meet the standard of the death penalty in the jurors' eyes? We'll see, but it may not be easy for them to decide. Ron, you make some really great points because every crime, every murder is horrendous. It, ne it, it never should happen. And when you have four individuals who are killed uh, in the same house and with, in such brutal ways, of course it's, it's disturbing. But I, when we were looking at a little bit of the case law when it came down from the Supreme Court, as you said, the reason we have these aggravating factors is so that not everyone is sentenced to death when they commit a, a crime. And as you said, it's for the worst of the worst. And I know there's a conversation right now, particularly I think in Arizona, where they believe that the death penalty is used arbitrarily. And it, it provides a lot larger conversation about whether or not we should have it. Um, but then again, the reason we have it is deterrence, right? And to provide some sort of justice. And so for when you commit these horrendous crimes, the only just punishment 
is that you be executed. And then the other side of it is, so that it's a way to deter, but then the other side of it is, is that it provides a sense of justice to the family members. And they're sitting in that courtroom, and they're listening to this, and they want justice for their family members. It's really, it's so tough putting uh, 12 people in that position to make that decision. Absolutely, and you know, we talk about the reasons for punishment, and yes, deterrence is a, a big part of that, but Clearly, in cases like this, you know, having the death penalty wasn't a deterrent here. Uh, this horrible crime still happened. Uh, another part of it is, yes, a feeling of justice for the families, but s sentencing him to life in prison without a possibility of parole is a pretty harsh punishment, too. Another reason that we have punishment in a lot of cases, for cases outside of the death penalty, is for rehabilitation, to say, oh, no, you did something wrong and this is what's gonna happen to you and maybe you'll learn something out of this and become a better person. With the death penalty, that option goes out the window. If Matos goes to prison for the rest of his life, he could end up being a changed man. If you kill him, he doesn't have that opportunity. And these are all factors that the jurors are gonna to have to weigh. See, I, I think the biggest factor for the jury really, when you break it all, <clears throat> excuse me, when you break it all down, is Tristan. Do they really want to kill the father of a young boy? That's what I think is really going to be in their mindset. Um, I, I think you take away all this conversation that he was bullied and he suffered from asthma and that he stayed with his cousin at the airport to make sure she was safe and all that stuff. At the end of the day, I think what you see right there, guys, on that screen is, a, is young Tristan. I think that is going to play in their minds. I think that's the only thing that's really going to weigh one way or another for them to determine if they want to kill this guy or not. But even that could go both ways because you look at, at Tristan and the jurors could say, well, is it better for this child, for his father who murdered the rest of his family to still be around, uh, for him to know through his whole life that his father is in jail after killing his mother? Is that something that's going to be good for him? Or you know, if they decide we're going to give him the death penalty, then you know, he's out of the picture. At the same time, people are on death row for a long time, so it's not like he's going to be gone immediately either, you know, if they do sentence him to death. It's happening less and less, though. Correct me if I'm wrong. We, I don't see a lot of people being sentenced to death. I, I mean, I, even even being executed. I mean, I, I think there's, a, there's probably uh, people that get sentenced, but I don't see the level of executions that maybe it was in the past, or maybe I'm not seeing enough. I don't know. What do you, what do you think about that? Is it, is it becoming more um, obscure to see these kinds of these sentences? Uh, yeah, we have been seeing, uh, you know, from state to state, you know, lesser amounts of executions. Uh, we did have earlier this year uh, you know, in one state where they had, I think, a, a whole bunch, I think it was like maybe a 10 or 11 executions over the span of a few weeks, uh, and that was very controversial. But in general, we are seeing less of it, I think. So we've been talking, there's people on the message boards that have been raising this question, and rightly so. Let's just provide a little bit more clarity. He's got four, there's four victims here, right? So it, each one is a determination about whether he should be sentenced to death. So for example, they might say, you know what? He deserves life in prison. Correct me if I'm wrong, but he deserves life in prison for maybe uh, Gregory Brown, but that Margaret Brown killing, that deserves the death penalty. So he could face the death penalty for any one of the four. Yeah, you know, this is quadruple murder. Uh, while it all happened you know, on the same day, these were different acts, these were different crimes. He was sentenced, uh, he was convicted of four separate crimes. And yeah, you could say oh, with uh, you know, Nick Leonard and Gregory Brown, you know, there was a commotion and Matos claimed that you know, he was fighting with them. But then you look at Margaret Brown, which you know, took place after the fact, or Megan Brown, who you know, he said you know, he feared was gonna kill him, but didn't provide any evidence that she was actually doing anything. Uh, some of them could be viewed uh, worse than others, absolutely. Right. And I, I wonder how much the defense was thinking about this penalty phase in the actual trial, because how many times did we hear when Adam Matos was on the stand, Mr. Matos, did you ever zip tie anybody's hands while they were alive? No. Did you ever put a plastic bag on somebody's head when they were alive? No. Did you ever drag them into the car when they were alive? No. Just showing that that level of pain and suffering was that is not there, that there was no torture, mm -hmm. that he killed them, but uh, they might not have necessarily felt this level of pain or suffering that the prosecution wants to put forward. You have to admit that they had that in their in their mind. I would oh, imagine. Absolutely, hundred percent. Because when you think of people who uh, 
you know, may deserve the death penalty. You're you know, usually thinking of you know, these horrible serial killers or these people who you know, have these you know, really elaborate plans where they you know, have tortured their victims before brutally murdering them, and the defense was trying to show. That's not what happened here. Yes, this was terrible. Yes, he killed four people. And the jury ultimately believed that it was premeditated murder, but was it the worst of the worst? And the defense was trying to argue, no, it wasn't. Right. Ron, I want your thoughts on a clip I'm about to play. Uh, James Siegler, the owner of the Fisherman Shack, testified for the prosecution. Now, the prosecution really brought up two witnesses. They didn't provide any victim impact statements, no family members of the deceased talking about what their lives are life and that like now without, uh, in, because of this crime. We'll talk about that in a minute, but I want uh, to talk a little bit about the testimony of James Siegler and how important it was for the jury. Thank you, Judge. Uh, Mr. Siegler, we previously heard from you uh, that on August 28, 2014, you were in contact with Megan Brown via text message and, and phone. Uh, do you recall that? Yes. Now, Judge, may I approach the witness with States 1DP? You may. Which previously has been shown to the defense counsel. Um, I want to show you States 1DP. Uh, do you recognize these? Yes, they're my text messages back and forth. And are these text messages back and forth uh, from, with, uh, with Megan? The, the number you knew to be uh, for Megan Brown's phone? Yes. And the ones that are labeled incoming, are those the messages she sent to you? Yes. And the ones that are labeled outgoing, are those the messages you sent to her? Yes. Now, uh, there's a date and time in Greenwich Mean Time. You agree with me that we're in, at the time, we were in Eastern Daylight Time? Yes. Uh, so these would be uh, all five hours ahead, at least as listed on this particular sheet. Okay. You agree? Yes. Yes. Now, um, and at the time when law enforcement was investigating, you allowed them to come and download these messages from your phone so they could be preserved? Yes. And these do appear to be the same messages from Megan yes. Brown that you received? Yes, I remember the wording. Okay. Judge, at this time, the state would like to move states 1DP into evidence. Any, any objection? Uh, yes, sir. All right, same previous objection. Yeah, and authenticity. All right, I'll go ahead and overrule that objection. They'll be admitted as states number one. Okay, and Mr. Sigler, if you could just read that first incoming message from Megan Brown's phone number. Jimmy, some serious shit is going on. My son's dad tried to kill me with a knife and is threatening to come back and finish me off. Okay, and if you could read your three text messages to her. I, my reply was, are you okay? And she replied, I'm, I, made a, I make a police report, I'm going to a funeral, and then I'll get with you afternoon, okay? That, that was your oh, I, That was my testimony, yes. I said I'd, I'd make a police report. Okay, and then did you send her another one? And then after, it says, yes, it says he's not even in town, is he? And that's your text message to her? That was my text message back to her, yes. All right, and then what was her next text message her to you? Her next text message was, yes, my son's dad. I came home last night, and, and last night and he put a knife to my throat and told me he was going to effing kill me. I had no choice but to grab the knife and plead. He cut my thumb. ND, my son woke up. He took off. Cops are looking for him. He keeps threatening me, telling me he has... He's telling me he's going to come back and finish me off. And then I replied, if you need help, let me know. And she replied back, thanks, I just want them to find him. Okay. And uh, you indicated subsequent to some of these, or in the midst of some of these text messages, you did have a voice conversation with her? Yes, I did a backup call and called her back and asked her, or, Asked her if she needed help, that if she wanted to, yeah, she could. Without going into those details, since we already heard testimony about that, but was she discussing some of the same things that you uh, received in these text messages? Yes. Uh, so, and if it relates to the content of these messages from Megan Brown's phone number, yes. uh, do they appear to be in the manner that she spoke and about the subjects that she was speaking to you about? Yes. And does, uh, do you have any doubt that they were from her based on your no. conversation with her? All right, Judge, I have no more questions. 
Mr. Sigler, thank you very much, sir. Welcome back to the Law and Crime Network, everybody. This is Jesse Weber. You were watching the second witness that was put forward by the prosecution in the Adam Matos case, the death penalty phase, the penalty phase of this case. And basically, they only called two witnesses. And I want to talk about a little bit about what you just heard from James Siegler, the owner of the Fisherman Shack where Megan Brown worked. And I also want to talk about the fact that they didn't provide any victim impact statements. So, Ron, let's talk a little bit about this. Um, first, we saw the testimony of James Siegler testifying about those nine. He knew that Megan had a, not put out a 911 call uh, against Adam Matos that he, and that, she thre that he threatened her with a knife. He knew all about that. He was reading the text messages between him and her talking about that. Now, that's a victim, a victim in this case talking to him. How important is that for the jury here? Uh, it's, that's very important. Uh, you know, we talked about how, you know, the defense was trying to show maybe during Matos' testimony that, you know, this wasn't as bad as, you know, some killings were. But when you get some of the background here from this witness, it shows that this was a little bit darker than uh, Matos was trying to let on. And I think that being reminded of that and uh, sort of like the background of this situation uh, could push some jurors. Uh, towards the death penalty. I mean, it's really, I mean, that line finished me off. Yeah. And, and that shows the premeditation, mm -hmm. it shows reflecting on it. I mean, it's all adding into it. So we, we talked about earlier how there's evidence from that trial that's definitely going to be in their minds as they determine whether or not he should be sentenced to death. Now, I, I did think it was interesting that the prosecution didn't put forward any victim impact statements, no statements from family members of the victims here saying, my life will never be the same because of this uh, horrendous crime. You took them away from me. Um, my life will not be complete. Really, we, we've seen in other cases. Why do you think the prosecution didn't opt to put them in? I wouldn't be surprised if they mentioned that in their closing today uh, because you know, if I'm the prosecutor, if I didn't have victim impact statements, I would say to the jury today, uh, normally we would have family members of the victims come and speak to you about what this loss means to them. We can't do that because the family members were also murdered. Oh, wow. Okay, that's, see, now that's, that's an interesting play. I would think, see, I would think they did, did we talked to Bob Bianchi about it yesterday. I was of the opinion that maybe they didn't want to put those family members through it, whichever ones are around, you know, say, why put them on the stand? Because you don't need to do it. And Bob stressed that you don't need to do it. They have enough of a strong case and there'd be a danger on appeal that they're just doing it for the, the shock value, right? That it's mm -hmm. not necessary. You're just doing it to shock the jury. Yeah, there's definitely that too. You, uh, you don't want to uh, overplay your hand and risk some sort of issue that could be fought on appeal. Yeah, it, it's... Um, it's interesting. What do you expect from their closing arguments today? You talked a little bit about it for the state. Uh, what is the defense going to do? What is the state going to do? What do you anticipate their arguments to be? Uh, the defense is, I think, going to keep going with what they were doing during the trial. They're going to keep saying, you know, yes, you know, jurors, you didn't believe that this was self-defense, but it was. Uh, Matos took the stand. You heard from him during the trial. I. Uh, he was very upset about this afterwards. Uh, I believe uh, during the main part of the trial, the defense used the phrase paralysis of the soul, mm -hmm. uh, which was questionable, but maybe we'll hear that again. Uh, you're going to hear about his upbringing, his background, how you know, this is not an evil monster who deserves to be put to death, uh, even if you believe that he did commit a horrible crime put him away for life, uh, he doesn't deserve worse than that. Do you think the defense is really gonna play on the morality of this for the jurors? Like, what? May, not that they're gonna be disrespectful, but they said, life, shouldn't it be nature, shouldn't it be God who decides when someone lives or dies? But then in the back of their minds, they'd be like, Adam Matos didn't make that decision. He made it on his own. He ended four lives. So I, I wonder how much they're gonna play on the morality of this and say, you know, take the law away, take all of this. You have in your hands to determine whether a, a father, a son, a brother should be killed. And I think that's what they might do. If, he, if the defense doesn't feel like they have any other argument, then I think it would be a good idea to use that argument because that is ultimately when, when it comes down to are you comfortable with the death penalty? Are you comfortable putting someone to death? Uh, that goes beyond, does, it, does this person deserve to die? You could think that Adam Matos is this horrible monster and d does deserve to die. But if 
you personally as a juror aren't comfortable being the one who puts him to death, then that could be enough to uh, sway a juror otherwise. Even if you do believe that the aggravating factors are there, if you just can't bring yourself to do it, and that's what the defense could try to push. The prosecution kind of did a, <clears throat> excuse me, kind of did a flavor of this a little bit, and I thought it was an interesting tactic. See, Adam Matos has a brother, Peter, and what they teased out was, then they had Rose Matos on the stand, which we're gonna play in a minute, and she said, didn't they grow up yeah. at the same time? Mm -hmm. they, one year diff age difference, went to the same schools, grew up the same way, had the same people in their life, he didn't grow up and kill four people. I mean, they didn't exactly say that, but it was enough for a juror to be like, good point. Yeah, when you're trying to base your defense and your argument against the death penalty as, you know, this was his background that put him in this situation and you have someone who grew up with essentially the same background who didn't kill four people, uh, that blows a huge hole in your argument, your defense right there. So. Uh, yeah, so that goes back to the defense trying to play on the morality of the death penalty in general. And, you know, if you don't have much to say about this particular case and you don't have a strong, specific argument in your client's defense, and that's all you have left, then that's what you do. Yeah. I, I, I am curious about your thoughts about Rose Matos. I mean, she, she took the stand, and we're going to play it in a minute. And, you know, just here's a mother who... I mean, she's really put in a, a horrific position. Imagine the fact that your son has just committed a quadruple homicide. Um, she said at one point, you know, I, I'm just really hurt. You know, I tried to raise him a certain way to, to solve problems that you don't just see on, by what you see on TV. Um, she talked about his upbringing. Really, he had a tough upbringing. But, but really, I just was, if you connect to her, it's really, she's put in an impossible situation, mm -hmm. right? And, and, and I just thought it was... Um, I just thought it was really tough to watch. Oh, absolutely. And it was compelling for the defense. Yeah, and then you have the jury sitting there thinking, you know, okay, we've heard from, from this man's mother, and now we have to decide whether or not to kill her son. Yeah, yeah, and they're right there. They're in the mm -hmm. courtroom. Let's play a little bit of her testimony. Um, this is the testimony of Rose Matos, Adam Matos' mother. We do expect live coverage any moment. Now, as soon as we have it, we'll make sure to turn to it. But in the meantime, here is the testimony of Rose Matos in the Adam Matos case. Please introduce yourself to the jury. My name is Rose Matos. And Ms. Matos, um, how do you know Adam? Adam is my son. Ma'am, you're going to have to talk up. You're in the microphone, but you... you Adam Matos is my son. Thank you. How old is Adam? I think he's 32. And how old were you when you had Adam? Maybe 20, 21. Is Adam your first child? Adam's my second child. How many siblings does he have? One. Who's your first child? Peter, to his son. I, I want to talk to you about first, um, did Adam have any health problems growing up? Yes. What kind of problems? He had chronic asthma. When did he develop that asthma? Pretty much when he was born. And how did that affect him? <sighs> A lot of things he couldn't play sports, couldn't run, he didn't speak well. Was he ever hospitalized for it? Numerous times. Approximately how many times would you say? More than 10 times. Now, when, where was Adam born? Pennsylvania. Do you remember where in Pennsylvania? It's in Philadelphia. It's in North, I think it's North Philadelphia. North Philadelphia? Mm -hmm. How long did you live in North Philadelphia after Adam was born? Oh, gosh. Uh, maybe seven, seven years old. Can you walk me through um, approximately how many times did your family move while Adam was growing up? We moved a lot of times. More than 10 times, maybe 12. 10 to 12 times? Yes. Why is that? I was looking for better schools. The environment wasn't really great. What do you mean by that when you said the environment wasn't great? 
He was uh, bullied. He was bullied in first grade, second grade, third grade. And I just continued to look for better schooling for him. Was there ever a point in time when you were living in a, in a car with Adam and Peter? Yes. When was that? I can't remember exact what year it was, but Adam was young. Okay. Uh, where was Adam's father while he was growing up? Uh, he was doing his thing. I don't know. He was doing his life. He didn't care. He didn't want anything to, you know, he, he apologized to Adam, but... He had his life, and he chose drinking beer and carrying on. And Was he ever involved in Adam's life? No. Did Adam ever meet him? Yes. How many times? Maybe three times. Did he ever stay with him? No. Um, did his father ever participate in any activities, school events, anything? No. Did Adam have any interaction with his father aside from the times he met him? No. Did he receive any support from his father? No. I know there was an incident, I think Adam was about four years old with a, a neighbor child. Can you tell us about that? Adam was on his way to the store and he was running down the steps and I heard this scream. It was so loud. I ran down the steps. He was screaming on the top of his voice. He could barely talk. The neighbor kid had whooped him with the munition blind, the plastic munition blind, twice. <coughs> and ripped his skin open in, in his back. And it was really hard for Adam. He had to go to the hospital after that, and his asthma started up once again. Did he have any other um, incidents where he was bullied like that by other children? Yes. I think he was in second or third grade. He had to go to the hospital, and I used to ask him, what's the matter, Adam? You seem upset. You need to tell me I can't help you. He wouldn't tell me. Till one day I said, Adam, it, you have to go to school. But, Mommy, I, I can't. And I said, Adam, you have to. So he told me, he said, Mom, there's these two boys that keep on roughing me up. So I said, don't worry. Mommy will be there after school. Make sure you'll be okay. But it still got pretty mad, and he was sick all the time because he was upset. I know there was at least one incident um, with his grandfather. That's your father. Can you tell us about that? My dad, he was alcoholic. He was verbally and physically abusive. He used to scare Adam, and his pop don't scare him. He's just a little boy. Every kid don't like to be scared, especially when they have to go to sleep by themselves at night. And my dad would say, Kuko's going to come and get you. Kuko means the monster's going to come get you. And Adam would just run behind me and he did it a couple of times where it was tough to see Adam, you know, frightened. He was frightened. Did Adam ever see any um, abuse of you by your father? Yes. Such as what? One day my dad came home and he was drunk. He wanted to have sex with a woman in my apartment. And I told him, you can't do that in my house. I have two boys I have to protect, and they don't need to see stuff like that. So my dad pretty much, he pushed the boys. The boys were trying to protect me. He pushed the boys out of the way, almost knocking Adam out. And he ran after me with a knife. How did that affect Adam? It affected both of them. They didn't want to be there. They didn't want to be there in the apartment anymore. They didn't know when he was going to come back. So we pretty much had to move from there. I know there also you had a, a boyfriend that you lived with when Adam was in elementary school, a doctor, is that right? Yes. 
Did Adam ever witness any abuse of you by that boyfriend? Yes. Can you tell us a little bit about what he may have observed or seen? Uh, one day I was came home from work and uh, we were disagreeing. And I said, that we need to talk, let's talk. And he didn't want to talk. And Adam had walked in the room and he body slammed me against the floor. He body slammed you? Body slammed me. And I hurry up for Adam not to see that I was hurt. And the second time, I came home from work. He was complaining that, you know, Adam had friends over and it was kind of late. And I said, well, I told him it was okay. His punishment was up. And he told me, well, this is my effing house. And I told, you know, I called the shots. And I said, please, if you're mad at me, take it on me. But don't take it on my children. So pretty much, uh, he pushed me so hard that I flew a couple feet away. And my back was pretty much, I was crippled, I was crippled at least three months. I even had to have back surgery. And it was tough on the boys seeing me so sick. They never see mommy like that. I think uh, maybe around that time you and Adam were in a car accident? Yes. Can you talk a little bit about that incident? I had just had got an accident in September of 2000. I tried to try to hit us from behind. Adam was in the front seat with me. Uh, it was a horrific accident. Three people you got killed. Not hear her at all. It was a horrific accident where three people got killed. Not in my car, but around my car. I had a concussion, and I, I had like fractured my chest, and pretty much that, that was tough because, you know, it was a tragic, you know. And Adam was in the front seat with you during that? Yes. While you were living with, with the doctor, Yes. Um, I think there was an incident where Adam was about 10 years old and he was arrested with a pipe. Yes. A marijuana pipe. Yes. Can you talk about that and where he got that item? Adam had taken the doctor's marijuana. It was glass made, it was like a glass. It was to use marijuana. I found it in his drawer, and I told him, you need to get rid of this. You found it in his drawer? I found it in the doctor's drawer. It's like a, a jewelry box for men. I said, you need to get rid of this, because if the boys find this, and you always send them in the room to get whatever you want, and if the boys see this, what they're going to think of you or me? He says, well, they shouldn't be in my room. Adam went still. Adam went in the room, and he took it. But Adam got arrested that day. And he, I told Adam, you need to tell the officer the truth, who it belonged to, because I knew who it belonged to. Who was at the police station with Adam um, after he was arrested? It was I and doc Dr. DiBolito. Okay. Um, and did the doctor discourage Adam from telling the police where he got it? Yes. There was a point where Adam was trying to create a career for himself, is that right? Yes. What did he want to do? He wanted to be a like auto technician, uh, making sounds and for music. The DJ? I wasn't sure what that, you know, along that meant, but you can say a DJ or, yeah. How old was he when he was trying to work on that? It was just a few years ago. I can't remember exactly what, what year it was. Where was he living? He was living in a property that I had rented. And he, he had his own apartment. And where was the school that he was going to for... Now we do have a live feed in the Adam Matos case. It's closing day in the death penalty phase of the Adam Matos case. Let's go to it now. In the courtroom, I would appreciate that. The door will be open. You can leave at any time. And as you all know, this is being live streamed. So it's not like you can't watch it. 
So if you don't believe that you can listen to the closing arguments of both sides, either side, then I just ask that you remove yourself from the courtroom. I don't want to have to make a statement in front of the jury to either side. Does everybody understand? Yes? All right. Uh, we'll begin um, as soon as the jury arrives. Who's going to do the first opening for the state? <coughs> you are both doing both of them? No, we're only one. Oh, you're only doing one. Are you going first? Yes? Yes. All right. Um, just so everybody knows, at the end of the state's closing, I'm going to take a break with the jury. At the end of the fence's closing, I'm going to take a break with the jury, and then I'll um, go ahead and read them the final instructions. And they can go so you're watching the, the defendant right there. Adam so Matos is in his prison jury. garb. He is now, this is the most important day, really, to, uh, where the state and the defense will present their closing arguments in the penalty phase of this case. The state arguing that Mr. Mato should be sentenced to death, the defense claiming with a litany of mitigating factors that he should be faced with life without, in prison without the possibility of parole. Uh, but <clears throat> the question becomes, do the aggravating factors outweigh the mitigating factors? Ron, what do you think? Um, it's a really close call on this one. Uh, this is a horrible quadruple murder. Uh, he, you know, killed his ex-girlfriend, her boyfriend, her parents, uh, stayed in the house for days afterwards. Uh, this may be enough for the jury to think this guy is a monster and put him to death. At the same time, uh, we've seen arguably worse uh, here on the Law and Crime Network. So when you compare it to other things and you start to think about worst of the worst does this qualify it might but we'll see what the jury has to say see i think that's a point for the defense to make that let, let's talk about the death penalty uh jurors this is really designed for the worst of the worst of the worst crimes and then go into detail why mr matos does not fit into that category and i think that might be the play here because correct me if i'm wrong they have their jury instructions that the judge will read to them but they also could be persuaded by the defense's and the prosecution's closing arguments, and they can include things in there that might not necessarily be in the jury instructions, right? Oh, absolutely. Uh, you know, if they're looking at any reason not to kill him, uh, you can certainly find those. Uh, this is not a case of someone who you know, was a serial killer who murdered a series of strangers over the course of years, as we've seen in other cases that we've covered. This is not a case of someone who is completely without remorse, as we've seen in some other cases. This is a guy who, you know, in a very tense emotional situation, uh, whether you use it as an excuse or not, it was a very tense situation, and he murdered four people who he knew, who he claimed uh, were going to kill him, whether you believe that or not. Uh, he said that he was angry about it. He was upset about it afterwards. So that could be enough for some jurors to be convinced not to kill him. What do you think about the fact that he knew these people? That he can said his own words where they were like family to him. They were kind of, they were his family in a way. Um, but the idea that these weren't complete strangers that he did this to, do you think that's a factor for the jury that, you know, he gained their trust, he was living with them, and then he massacred them? What do you think about that? Again, you know, I could see that going either way, and I know I've been saying that a lot this morning, uh, but on the one hand, you could say this these were people who were like family to him, and yet he did this anyway, yet he shot them. He hit some of them repeatedly with a hammer. Uh, this was a very gruesome crime. Uh, but on the other hand, you could say this wasn't some twisted random act of violence. This was a situation that pushed this person, Adam Matos, over the edge for one reason or another, and it led him to act. Yeah. You know, you're seeing all the, the family of the Browns and the Leonards and people that are involved in this case. I think on the opposite side, uh, sitting behind Matos on that side is his family members. I'm sure uh, his mother Rose is there as well as his brother Peter and his aunt and other family members and friends who testified on his behalf yesterday. You can only imagine, I was thinking about this yesterday, the, the, the pressure that they felt to testify for him. Uh, they, they, f they believe, and rightfully so, that perhaps their words can have an impact on the jury in saving either their, uh, this, this man's life. And you have to think about the pressure that's put under them right now as well. 
Uh, yes, and if the jury sees that there are still people in the world who care about Adam Matos and want him to remain alive, uh, that could be enough for them to decide to keep him alive. Uh, you know, yes, he committed these horrible crimes, and he's going to be away. He's going to be out of removed some, from society. Yeah, his life uh, is over. His life is done. Whether he is physically alive or not, he is removed from society uh, from this day forward. So if you want to, for the sake of his family who don't want to see him die, uh, not give him the death penalty and just sentence him to life without parole, jury may do that. They, they had an interesting discussion between the judge and the attorneys last week about providing a definition of what life in prison without the possibility of parole is. And then it entered into a discussion of, well, he could be granted clemency. There could be a change in the law. He might, it's possible if he's not executed, might be released from prison. But really, Ron, what is the likelihood of that ever happening if he's uh, sentenced to life without, in prison? Slim to none. Uh, you know, you don't really see... You know, when you talk about clemency and changes of the law, usually you're talking about drug crimes where, you know, uh, drugs are reclassified or there are new statutes that classify crimes different ways. You're not going to see that for quadruple murder. Yeah. So I don't see that happening here. And uh, this isn't a case where he's denying that he did it and decades down the line, uh, some DNA evidence will come out saying that he's innocent. No, yeah. he admits to it. And look, Charles Manson, he just died in prison, 83 years old. So uh, I don't see a change in the law and a clemency in this kind of uh, situation. The jury is coming in now. Um, this will, again, we are going to be hearing the closing arguments from the state, the closing arguments for the defense, and then a determination, deliberations amongst them about whether or not Adam Matos should be sentenced to death. And I've said it before, I don't believe that the deliberations will be as short as it was for them when they had to convict him or when they chose to convict him. But I wouldn't be surprised if we do have a determination later on today. So here we go. Now we know that the jurors have settled in. Adam Matos is on his side. The prosecution is on their side. Judge Mary Hansel is about to address them. And this is going to 